Great. Great. Why well, don't I uh, get us going? First of all, let me say thank you. Uh, I know that you have been bounced around a little bit <laughs> the last couple of weeks of LDI being on and then not on and back on in a modified form. Uh, and you've been very gracious to hang with uh, those uh, left and rights and ups and downs. It certainly is an interesting time period that we are in as a church uh, with transitions. And, and so some of the juggling has been uh, a little bit difficult to consider uh, in terms of our programming, but we're on. And in many ways, because um, there's been a, a deep desire that has been voiced uh, for discipleship, for engaging in one another's lives, uh, and in particular for this topic of relationships, of how to foster deeper connections and uh, a richer sense of community. Um, and, and so I, I'm pleased that we're able to, even in a modified form, uh, run LDI. For those who have been involved uh, in this in previous iterations in the evening, uh, it's had a very intensive feel. We're going to maintain a bit of that intensive feel, but it's going to move a little bit from uh, a lot of primarily small group discussion to um, small group discussion that's more workshop oriented. So Tony and I and others will be working in and giving some presentation that will alleviate some of the, the need for um, you as facilitators to uh, be able to kind of master material or make sure that um, you're able to explain everything. So that will become clear um, as uh, time goes on with this training. But uh, let me open us up in a word of prayer before we go any further. God, ever since you came into this world, and this is what we remember during the season of Lent, that you would um, humiliate yourself to take on the form of a human and to die a criminal's death. Uh, you have issued to us a call to go and make disciples. Um, and so we want to heed that call. And so we pray that even during our time together this afternoon, uh, you would provide for us the ability to think and to prayerfully apply that command to go and make disciples. We ask for each of the lives that will be represented in uh, the conversations that we'll be having over the next six weeks, um, and ask that you would bless, bless those conversations and enable us to connect with you and with one another, uh, to so equip each other uh, for a life of um, loving witness uh, and care uh, that it can truly be said that see how they love one another uh, that there is something truly different about the way that this group of people interacts um, so guide us in all of that uh, we pray in Christ's name Amen um, so to begin with we're going to jump into a little bit of an exercise and this is something that in the first year that we ran uh, the Lenten Discipleship Institute, I think in 2013, we had a little work group to help us create the curriculum and the uh, uh, overview of what we would like to do in what has turned out to be a four-year um, uh, four program. And we began one of our sessions by asking the simple question, describe, uh, describe an experience of someone who has helped you become a better disciple. Describe an experience in which someone has entered into your life in, in, a, in an intentional way to specifically help you become a better disciple. What we're going to do is we're going to let you sit and think about that for a minute, and then we're going to break you up into groups of three. And you're going to have an opportunity to break up into those groups several times throughout this afternoon. So this will be the first of many occasions. So think about that. Describe an experience of someone or a person who helped you become a better disciple of Christ in an intentional fashion. Okay, you got, you got that person in your mind? All right, why don't you break up into groups of three? And as much as possible, three.
Well, thank you for sharing. Um, when we asked this question, Tony and I, in our work group, um, we were very encouraged by the answers that were given with respect to the depth of relationships that folks have had uh, and the intentionality that different people had experienced over the years. What we were a little bit surprised by was when that occurred. Uh, in a group of about 12 people, almost every single person referred to this intentional discipleship occurring in either their high school or college years, maybe grad years. Only one person mentioned someone in their adult life. And it struck me that, gosh, that's not good. The church is dropping the ball on its most central task of making disciples. Uh, and so we, we are here to address that issue. It's not that in six weeks we can go, bam, make a disciple and be done with it. But it is part of the process to begin shaping a culture, shaping expectations, shaping a desire and connections that could foster these types of relationships and move us you know, one degree, two degrees more uh, in developing a culture of connectedness and intentional building into each other's lives. That was really the heart behind the Lenten Discipleship Institute. I think it's often the case that as leaders we could underestimate people's desires to grow. You know, we think that, oh, you know, why do people volunteer for this? Or why don't they show up to that? Or why aren't they scribbling madly notes at the sermons? Or why aren't folks talking more in our small groups? Or whatever it may be. Where I think it's not so much that we, the problem is that we underestimate their desire. It's not that they don't have desires, but sometimes we overestimate their abilities, overestimate people's abilities to actually know how to live out their Christian life. They may want to study the Bible more deeply, they just haven't had anyone really help them. They may want to have a more vibrant prayer life, but hasn't had anyone to really model that for them. Maybe they want a better marriage. Maybe they want a, a better way of building relationships and roommate situations, but they haven't had someone actually step into their life and help them in an intentional manner. So the Discipleship Institute was a desire to take four years. If we have a person for four years, and there's a reason why we picked that model in the university town, what are the kinds of things that we would wish for them to have over the course of the five years? What would we want them to know to be able to do and in the end, how would we wish for them to have been connected? So year one, we had uh, the teaching sermon content uh, on knowing God, and then the spiritual discipline of a life of prayer. In year two, we had the content of knowing the gospel, and then looking at the discipline, spiritual uh, discipline of being a witness. In year three, we had knowing the God of the Old Testament, uh, and we had the discipline of a life of generous justice. And this year, um, we were supposed to do the kind of knowing the New Testament and, and a life of community and relationships, but uh, Gordon has Genesis on his brain, and so we decided we're going to take it off from Genesis, but we're still doing uh, a, a, um, a life of uh, connectedness. So uh, if you look at your handouts, everyone, do you have that? Um, you see that uh, we have this discipleship institute with this overall uh, desire for connectedness and developing these intergenerational uh, connections around content that are very intentionally designed to invite you to get into each other's lives. You will see that there is, there, this is not a tame exercise. We are going to be diving into some stuff. You might regret having signed up for this. We're going to be diving into some stuff that's going to invite you and other people in your group to ask some really hard questions about our lives, uh, the way that we relate, the way that we deal with conflict. Um, uh, and so uh, it, it's going to, I imagine, be some tender conversations uh, as people are exploring these issues. Uh, but they're precisely the kind of conversations that we need to have if we're going to be engaged with each other's lives. 
So uh, what are those conversations? You'll see on uh, the table of contents. I'm not quite ready with your booklet, so um, you'll have the table of contents here. That, and this does cover the, the material uh, that we will be uh, addressing. And then we'll go have a chance to go through uh, a particular lesson. So if you look at the table of contents, I'm going to give you just a bird's eye view of the types of things that we're covering. Then we're going to dive down in a particular sample lesson. Um, I'll break for some questions after the table of contents. So you'll see week one, uh, Gordon will be preaching on designed to connect. And this is a passage of Adam and Eve that we were not made to be alone. And what lessons can we derive from that relationship? Uh, primarily in insisting that we are intended, we are designed to be in connection with others. Uh, in the group exercise, so after the service is over, people will file down into the fellowship hall and be... Uh, in their assigned to their various groups, and Tony will be doing the logistics uh, in a bit. Uh, the main exercise will revolve around becoming attentive to the way that we connect. So exploring some of the fundamental principles of, of relationships and in a way that helps you get to know each other. So we'll dive into lesson one a little bit more uh, in a bit. Lesson two will be on sibling rivalries. Uh, and that's the Cain and Abel story. And I'll be making the basic points that sin ruins relationships. The fall complicates relationships. But God gives us the opportunity uh, for restoration. And uh, there's uh, this one verse in Genesis chapter 4 where God speaks to uh, Cain who is very discontented that his uh, offering was not accepted in a way that Abel's was. Uh, and God says to Cain, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door, and its desires for you, but you must master it. Uh, I want to look at what are, sorry for the pun, but the crouching tigers and hidden dragons in our lives. You know, what, what are those things that are lurking within our hearts that often prevent us from relating well to people? Could be jealousy, could be pride could be a complaining spirit or a gossiping heart, whatever it may be. As you can tell, we're going to start diving into our lives. But we're also going to have a chance to look at those strengths that we bring in with the recognition that all of us, while we have crouching tigers in our lives, we also have things that could be released as genuine contributions to the life of the community. That if God were to fully empower us and we were to live a life of faith, we really could bring this virtue into our community life here and to begin to explore what those things are. Now, uh, you'll see also in lesson two that uh, there's this extra thing, and that is a conflict resolution questionnaire that you will be able to take online. This particular exercise is, uh, and I have the questionnaire right here, so ask questions. Um, I need to attain excellent results and cannot be limited by others. This definitely is true about me, and there's a scale. I'm always willing to listen to others' opinions, but I also want to give them mine. And there is definitely <laughs> true, definitely not true, and the scale in between, right? So you can take this by yourself, but we're also going to ask you to give it to a trusted friend, colleague, spouse, roommate, and to have them take it about you. Okay? It's an opportunity for you to self-assess, but also and you're going to need to find someone who will be willing to give you very honest feedback. <coughs> and the following week is our lecture on conflict <coughs> resolution, which you may need to enter into when you get this honest feedback. Um, but we ask that you not only take the questionnaire yourself, you give it to a friend, spouse, roommate, someone who really knows you, Tell them, I need the, I, I, this is my homework, you have to give me honest feedback. And, and then we'll debrief not only your self-assessment, but how you are perceived by others and the implications of that in the way that we resolve conflicts. All right, uh, and then lesson three. Okay, lesson three. Uh, is on family dynamics. This is Genesis uh, 37, the, um, Joseph and his brothers. 
And uh, the sermon will kind of leave us at the point of uh, recognizing that we all live in ecosystems, ecosystems of relationships uh, that are determined not only by the people in the relationships, but the particular context. And this is true for family, this is true for workplace, roommate situations, your dormitory. Uh, they are ecosystems in which you have to navigate relationships and learn how to cultivate um, practices to resolve conflict. Uh, and you'll see that there's another extra assignment that you'll be given during the week uh, to take uh, another kind of self-assessment on not only conflict resolution, but on the flip side of conflict resolution, how do you walk away from conflict? Uh, do you tend to kind of continue to beat yourself up over it? Do you tend to enter into recrimination against the other person? Yes, I apologize, but it really was the other person's fault, um, and, and so forth. Um, these lessons are designed to go deeper each week. Lesson four is on forgiveness. And we will be challenging folks to actually think about particular people in our lives from whom we need to receive forgiveness or for whom we need to forgive. Again, this is where the rubber meets the road. As you can see, each week is designed with the intention of diving in a little bit deeper. No one would be ready to share this in week one. You know, who has sinned against you? Whom have you sinned against? <laughs> but by week four, the lessons are designed to bring us into a space of trust with one another. Lesson five is uh, on um, love for the world. Having learned how to engage in a more deep, loving life uh, with one another, what would it look like as a church, not to always be thinking internally, but also loving the world. How do we love people who are not like us? And I think we can say pretty safely that we're not doing a very good job of that right now in our world. What does it mean to love the other? People who are not like us on the political spectrum, people who are not like us socioeconomically or racially, or whatever it may be. What does it mean to engage with people who are different? And are we actually responsible to be peacemakers with conflicts that we are not directly involved with? Are we called to enter into the fray? The answer, I think, is yes, but what does that look like? And then the last is making the pivot in Palm Sunday uh, on Love Express. Gordon will be uh, preaching on the anointing of Jesus' feet by Mary, and uh, it will enable us to move toward exercises that prepare us for Holy Week, but also as a way of summing everything up, um, to practice uh, blessing each other. So for those of you who have been in part of LDI in the past, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but the way I think of it is, think about your high school yearbook. Um, th at the end of your senior year, you all wrote notes to each other, you know, hugs and kisses, best friends forever, or whatever you might have wrote, a, a, a joke that you shared together the four years of high school. Things that you hope would be words of remembrance or affirmation of the friendship. I think about it this way, that we get a chance at the end of the session to pass around our booklets, there'll be a blank page at the end, and to write words of blessing and encouragement. Uh, scripture is full of people using words to bless others. And I don't think we do that enough of taking our words and using them to truly speak a blessing, believing that by God's grace, our words actually are infused with power. Um, and so we'll talk about a bit of the theology and practice of blessing. Uh, in addition to these lessons that you see that occur on Sundays, during the week there will also be devotional exercises Monday through Friday. So this is like a one-stop, Monday through Saturday. Uh, it's one-stop shopping, all your Lenten needs taken care of, <laughs> right in one fell swoop. So, um, why don't we pause right here. So you'll see, designed to connect, and this will give you uh, a good example. And we're actually going to do this lesson in a little bit faster form, uh, so that this first coming week, you will be very confident. You'll know exactly what the material is, and how to head into it. Um, so I'll give a, a, give a just brief welcome as folks file down. Then I'll invite uh, the groups to 
start this first to just get to know you exercise. So share your name, three facts about yourself. All right. And then I'll do a little bit uh, of a reflection, seven minutes max, of, uh, of the what and why of LDI. Really a little bit of what I just did for you earlier. Uh, and then this first exercise was uh, designed in such a way, we could go around and you know, share your personal testimony, but what we wanted to communicate with this first exercise was right from the get-go. It's about you within the context of relationships. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to have an exercise that just was talk about yourself, mm -hmm. right? talk about your testimony or how you came to Christ. We hope that those things come out in the course of the weeks together. We wanted an opening, get to know you kind of exercise that models immediately that this is about connecting, about relationships. And so the opening exercise is an invitation uh, to think about some of the most meaningful friendships, family members, communities that you've been a, a part of, uh, and to choose one to describe to the group, not, not a spouse, but someone outside of that. What qualities made this relationship special? You know, what, what helps you feel connected to that person or that group? How did the relationship become this way? Uh, and perhaps to put it in the form of a brief story that could be shared in a couple of minutes. As a way for you as a leader to have not only insight as to who this person is, but what this person values. So listen attentively to the kinds of ways that they're describing uh, intimacy and friendship and community. What are their aspirations and longings that had been met that actually might not be met here at Park Street? So did you catch that? So actually, let's do that right now. Um, we're going to, again, break up into your groups. Uh, of, no. 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 Oh, oh we're going to do that later. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. We're going to do that later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes? Do we as leaders start out with that, or do we ask to group that first? Great question. I would recommend that the leaders start, because as leaders, you can set the tone. Right? You, know, you want to set enough of a tone of vulnerability, but not oversharing. And the ability, which I'm banking on, to be somewhat concise. So we're hoping as leaders you're not going to turn this into a little sermonette. Um, but setting the pace of vulnerability and appropriateness and timeliness. Great, great question. All right. Uh, so the, the, the group discussion will then give people opportunities uh, to um, share these relationships. Tony's going to be doing an exercise on a facilitator tips. And if you find that folks in your group um, are just like giving 30 second answers, you know, what kind of questions can you use to draw folks out? Um, but you do want to hear uh, from as much as possible from, from everyone as they are comfortable. Uh, I would also be comfortable in saying that if you hear less from one and more from another, you know, that, that's fine. Let people kind of get in to the group at their speed. But we do want to hear something from everyone. Um, now, the basic trust behind this is that godly wisdom is given to the people of God. The kinds of things that you probably will be hearing that make for effective relationships are things that you should be hearing like the ability to forgive one another, or to engage in honest conversations, or this person really listens well to me, or we, you know, the list could go on and you could probably already start thinking about this in terms of answering it for yourself. We want to take those life experiences and generate the basis for engaging with this particular passage in Colossians chapter 3. Of Again, this is because we're going to get into some pretty heavy stuff as the weeks go on. We want folks to enter into this group dynamic with a sense of success uh, and, and on a positive note. So taking all the kind of positive things that you've heard, we're going to segue into Colossians chapter 3. And to look at um, Colossians chapter 3 as a listing, not a comprehensive listing, but a listing of, of these virtues that help us become a relational community. This is what God, through Paul, gave to the Colossian church uh, as the necessary advice for becoming the kind of people that 
will understand and model God's love to one another and to the world. So you'll see that we've taken each of uh, the virtues and turned them into a question, a diagnostic question to be asked. Okay? There's three sections to uh, Colossians chapter 3. The first section is on identity. This is who we are cultivated to be, being God's chosen people, being holy, being dearly loved. And so you see some questions off to the side about that. Then the next uh, section are uh, five kind of qualities that Paul enumerates. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And again, you'll see some questions off to the side. The last section is activities, some specific activities that Paul exhorts us to uh, engage with. And that is bearing with each other, forgiving whatever grievances you may have, forgiving as the Lord forgave, uh, and love. Put, it, put on love, which binds all these virtues together. And again, these are diagnostic questions. What we're going to do is, I'll get back up to, um, to what Jeff had asked. Uh, I will get back up after the discussion on um, sharing relationships that you've had. And I'll kind of break that, talk a little bit about Colossians. Again, it's more like Sorry, a five. I miss that. Five, five minute orientation on uh, Colossians, its place and its breakdown. And then I'm going to invite folks to um, stop and again in a time of reflection choose one question from each of the three categories. One identity question, one quality question, and one activity question. Okay? Well, and, yes? Are, is the physical setup, are we in one large room with tables? Is yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of like uh, the breakfast or the evening dinners. So there'll be tables down in the function. Um, and then uh, folks will, you know, I pick these questions and then we'll get back into the groups. And the goal is not to actually answer the questions. The goal is to hear from folks in the groups, what were the questions that you chose and why did you choose those questions? So someone might say, you know, um, I, I choose this kindness question. How do I, I respond when someone bumps into me on the sidewalk, cuts in the line, takes my... Because, you know, I realize, gosh, I have this commute every morning. By the time I get to work, I'm in a bad mood because I've been cut off at ALY for... Not that I'm saying anything personal on my part. This, but, you know, <laughs> cut off at ALY on my way. You get the picture. So not answering it, but just identifying the question. And again, I think as a leader, it will give you a pulse as to the things that your group members uh, are struggling with or yearning for uh, within uh, the LDI context. Um, and so you'll go around and share that. And then you'll conclude uh, the verses 2, 18, and 25. And to say, what from the sermon do you remember? Now, we think very highly of sermons around here. Um, at least I hope you think highly of the sermons around here. <laughs> uh, but what we think even more highly is the Word of God itself. We want to train people that in, as far as the sermons help you engage with the Word of God, great. But we don't want you primarily to be reflecting on the sermon. We want you to be helped by the sermon to actually reflect on the Word of God itself directly. So the questions are very much geared to not debrief the sermon, but the passage itself. So sometimes you'll see that one of our, uh, kind of after the worship service is over, the transition questions between the worship service and the group is to share, um, share something that struck you from the scripture passage today. Again, very intentionally designed. Not share something from the sermon, but share something from the scripture passage. Now, it may be something learned through the sermon, we hope it is, but even that slight shift in phrasing is an intentionally designed question to have people model um, that it's engagement with the Word of God. Okay. So you'll see Monday this exercise. Uh, Tuesday, prayerfully read through Colossians 3, reflect on the identity question for self-examination. So this is where members of your group will actually be invited to answer that question, to come up with uh, reflection as well as a strategy on how to change. And you'll see that for each of the sections afterwards. Um, in the following week, when you get to debrief uh, the weekly exercise, they will have already had the chance
to ponder at a pretty significant level in their devotionals, uh, Colossians chapter 3. And again, we designed this in a particular way. We recognize that some people are external processors. They'll be able to answer something immediately with no problem. You ask a question, and they're good to go. Other people are internal processors, and they'll need some time. What this does, by giving exercises as homework, is it levels the playing field. It enables everyone to come into next week and have something really prepared and ready to go that's thoughtful, uh, that's introspective, reflective, but also that provides some kind of action plan and that we can learn from each other uh, in terms of things that are created. All right, so that gives you kind of a deep dive into the lesson. I think at this point I'm going to turn it over to Tony, who will, I guess, walk you through stuff. Great. Okay. Um, so, thanks for being here. It's really exciting. I uh, really appreciate uh, you guys' willingness to take your time, your relational energy, and space and invest in people. Uh, it means a lot. Um, a discipleship program is not something that uh, a few individuals can run. <laughs> it has to be the, the church doing it. And so thank you for being the church. Appreciate that. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to be on page five on facilitator tips starting there. The first thing to know um, that uh, your role um, is not to be um, God. <laughs> your role is to be the facilitator. So as, as a leader, the first thing you need to know is God is active. God is already at work in you. God's already at work in each of your learners. He knows who's, who's going to be in your group. I don't know who's going to be in your group yet, but he knows who's going to be in your group. <laughs> Uh, and he is working all those details um, together. And so um, God is at work, um, and uh, you have the, uh, the, the opportunity to be involved in what uh, God is doing. Um, the biggest thing we want you to do as a facilitator is, is to listen lavishly. We, we're in a culture where um, usually uh, we don't have time to listen, right? We have time to formulate what we're going to say next uh, while that other person is talking. Um, and uh, we, we, we're arming ourselves with um, the next thing we're going to say. Uh, but, uh, but creating a, a space where we actually listen to people and, and help them feel really cared for, that's what we want you to do. So um, we have this um, simple little acronym of um, the art of listening that A is assume that God is already doing something. And that's again, we, we want to make sure, you're, you're, we're, not, we're not leading some corporate program. We are, um, we're being the church. And so we, we, we understand the, the context of everything is God and he is at work. Um, so R, uh, refrain from asserting your own opinions and correcting everything you find wrong. Uh, uh, so uh, if you're, uh, in, yeah, as a leader, that, that, that can be a difficult thing for us to do. Um, but uh, part of it is because you know that you learn best when you discover on your own. Um, and so as a leader, you can tell them something until you're blue in their face, uh, until you're blue in their face. Um, but uh, unless they discover it for themselves, um, they're not really going to own that. And so um, part of the listening that you do is to enable that person to discover it for him or herself. Um, one of the things as a leader that you want to do is, is to not be afraid of silence. You know how it is, you ask a question, and then the, there's no response. And uh, you know, it, it, it may be just a, a very brief period of silence, but for, once you ask the question, it feels like a really, really long time for you. And um, it is difficult not to uh, rush in to fill that silence. But we're asking you to, to refrain, refrain, because silence is your friend. People need time to think, especially if it's, it's a deep question. Give them time to think and to process. Um, and then um, C, T, train, train yourself to ask questions that draw and clarify what the other person is saying. And so um, here are some sample questions of, uh, of how you can bring them up. Uh, in general, you want open-ended questions, uh, not yes, no questions, but, uh, but questions that draw them out and uh, require more than a one-word answer. Um, you'll see that. Uh, on the back side of page five, so on page six, there are these leader notes um, that we give. Uh, so this is if you turn the, the, the leader notes. These are guidelines for you. So this is not um, uh, these these times um, are just to help you with the flow. Um, and there, when we do interrupt you, then um, obviously we're going to interrupt you. But otherwise, um, it's it's just a guideline. Um, and you'll see that uh, we've tried to provide you information as, as to why we have structured things the way it is. Um, 
And so uh, it, it kind of walks you through it and gives you a little hints like when you're doing the introduction to have the leader go first, model um, the length, model uh, the vulnerability. So the question that I had asked earlier. Um, and so um, it, we kind of walk you through and tell you what it is that we're trying to accomplish and how you can uh, accomplish it. But uh, don't feel like you're tied to the book and you have to get through every question and like if, 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 if a fruitful conversation is, is happening, don't feel like, okay, well, you know, sorry, that's, uh, that, that may be life changing for you, but we have a schedule to keep. <laughs> so again, this is what it means to, uh, to be, um, be open to the spirit. But you know, on the other hand, we don't want to leave you uh, without resources and without scaffolding. And so and this hopefully gives you enough for you to feel like you're prepared um, uh, and then um, that way uh, you, you are free to follow the Holy Spirit rather than forced to follow the Holy Spirit because you have nothing, no, no, no other plan. Um, so you'll see that, um, and as Walter described, for the first lesson, we're actually going to interrupt you twice. There is the, the, the larger orienta orientation, and then there's a second teaching followed by a second sharing. Um, that's uh, the only time we'll do that double one. In general, it'll be, you'll come down, um, you'll, you'll, um, you'll connect, and there'll be a brief question. There'll be one um, teaching time, and then the rest of it will be um, open-ended. But we do keep to the end time. So uh, well, that's, the one, that's the one time that we, we, we hold. Um, there's one lesson where we're not going to do teaching until the very end. That's the one where we do the conflict resolution. So we figured there's going to be plenty to talk about, um, uh, about your, which style of conflict resolution you have. Um, and then the teaching will be at the end of that lesson. That's lesson three. So we are now going to do a group exercise. We're going to uh, keep in mind the fact that we really do want to listen lavishly. So. Um, uh, what we're going to do is go back to lesson one, um, and there is a, uh, on page three, number two, the personal reflection asks you to think about your most meaningful friend, uh, uh, some of them, and then choose one of, your, one of your most meaningful relationships. And then in 2B you see what qualities make this relationship special, what helps you feel connected to this person or group. And then what we're going to do is, I'm going to, um, I'll, I'll give you a time of personal reflection, uh, actually, what, what I'm first going to do is I'm, I'm going to uh, divide you into groups of three, and then we'll have the uh, time of personal reflection. Um, so um, let me describe it first. Um, we're going to—you need to be in a group of exactly three people. So we will um, uh, we will make that happen. Um, so and what we're going to do is um, we're going to um, take turns trying three different roles. Okay. So um, we'll we'll have A, B, and C. For the first, first iteration, number A is going to spend two minutes sharing, answering the question. Person B is going to spend two minutes, uh, after that, is going to spend two minutes asking clarifying questions um, and drawing that uh, first speaker out. And um, person C is going to uh, be the timekeeper. Um, and um, so there'll be two minutes of um, one person speaking, person A speaking, two minutes of person B drawing questions out. And then one minute um, where the, the, the group of three kind of um, uh, shares observations about that exercise. And then um, we, uh, the A, B, and C, the, your roles will rotate. And so you'll get a chance to do um, each of those roles by the, by the time we're done. Is it clear what we're going to, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the exercise? Sure. Well, what, what are some observations that you learned from this exercise? Anyone want to share? So we observed that uh, sometimes two minutes feels like too much time, and sometimes two minutes feels like not enough time. Other observations? I think by having um, a designated person to ask questions, it, it, the questions were deeper, because it wasn't like, okay, now you take a turn, now I take a turn. You know, the, the polite conversation wasn't there. It was just very direct, like, I'm, I'm going to ask the questions, and the responsibility is on me. They were deeper. Good. I, I think something that came up for us was the challenge of like striking the balance of asking a question for our own information gathering, and how how is that going to be interpreted by the person who's speaking? Like you don't want to feel like you're probing deeply into their lives, but at the same time you want to facilitate the conversation by asking good questions. And so we were a bit conscious about how do we ask good questions without being too nosy. Yeah. 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 Y
and in New England. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. Good, good. So, um, um, part, one of the reasons we do this exercise is to point out there are actually three roles involved. When, when you're facilitating a group, all three roles are things you are actively doing. You are sometimes a person speaking. You are sometimes a person drawing out um, by asking sensitive, um, probing, but not you know, hounding questions. And you're also the timekeeper. So when you think about these three roles, which one felt most comfortable to you and why? Who wants to share? Which, which of those, um, speaker, question asker, or timekeeper felt most comfortable to, comfortable to you and why? Timekeeper, no responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but is that true? Is timekeeper no responsibility? Well, I'm naturally rude. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, who else? <laughs> Most comfortable, why? Asking. Asking, why? Because as an engineer, it's easy to be curious and mm -hmm. ask. Yes. <laughs> and I love that, that word, curious. Be curious about your learners. Be curious about who you talk with. So oftentimes in our conversations, we, 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 we go, oh yeah, I know what that person's gonna say. And we don't, we're not really curious, we don't really want to listen and to, draw, to ask us what's to draw them out. Go ahead. Um, which of those roles did you feel least comfortable in and why? So I want to share about that. Timekeeper. Okay, <laughs> so, so why? Because <laughs> you're not naturally rude like me. <laughs> because even when I wasn't the official listener, I found I was listening. And then, yes, I lost time. So I had my phone set, but but still, it was it was like oh, and when the phone when I could see it was coming close, I thought oh, I wish I could turn it off because I wanted to finish. Other people. I think the challenge for me is what uh, what was brought back to us when we were discussing like. You do want to ask the, the good questions, but um, how do you listen actively <coughs> without trying to formulate the, the question? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you know, you're, you're hearing them and you're going on this journey with them as they're sharing, but then it's like, oh, I could ask about this or this or this or this. And then just, like really trying to focus in on what would be something that would really bring them alive once again, that they've shared so much, and how do we keep this conversation going? Not like, oh, did I ask a wrong question, this is gonna shut them down and make them feel completely uncomfortable. So that's really where I'm like, I wanna ask a good question, because it feels like first impression, like how, how can we keep it going without being rude or being uh, you know, too nitpicky or nosy? Right, and then you have to balance that with, well, but this person has talked for two minutes and now it's time for us to you right. know, hear from su such and such person. And so it is, mm -hmm. uh, there is definitely um, a, a kind of dance to this, which is why um, we do ask about for wisdom. Yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah. coming back to that, mm -hmm. but you have other people in the group that would also ask good yeah. questions. That's so true. it's yeah. not all up to you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's a, in our last group last year, mm -hmm. actually I don't think we asked many questions. The group was such a good group that they yeah. asked each other questions. <laughs> Which is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to get to the whole right. Right. You know, yeah. about this. Okay, so I observed a couple of groups and I heard some phrases that I thought were helpful. Um, like, ooh, tell me more about that. So it's it's not um, a direct probing question. Yeah. It allows the person who's answering to sort of uh, choose how they're going to enter in mm -hmm. and which part they're going to say more about. Um, so it, it's a little bit more inviting if you're unsure. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think similarly, it, it, it uh, you can, what was the other, I think there was another question that somebody asked, like tell me more about that, or um, is there something that you can, uh, I don't know, just soften the question a little bit to make it less direct or to the point, yeah. more open. Mm -hmm. um, seemed like it was effective, and I heard it in a couple of the groups um, to allow the other, the other person to sort of think okay. and choose what level they're going. Because if you ask too personal, then you run those risks that you're talking yeah. about. And I guess what I would ask you, Tony, is do you have other phrases that maybe you could equip people with? Yeah, so um, the list would be, this is it's a very short list here, so uh, uh, on page 5C in the box. 
So can you can you tell me more about it? So it's just, you know, tell me more. So like I like it even as a statement as opposed to a question. So when you said this, what did you mean? So yes, these are these are great. Okay, uh, so uh, now uh, I know you guys have been sitting for a, lot, a while and you may have to sit a little bit, little bit while longer. I'm going to um, ask you a series of questions and you may need to move because of it. Okay, if you are an extrovert, can you please stand? <laughs> Introverts, you may remain seated. <laughs> okay, now, uh, now uh, I'm not just talking to, to the people who are standing, I'm talking to everybody. If you are an external processor, so if you think out loud and you like to talk things through by um, uh, um, with, with words, um, then I want you to move up a level, which means if you're an introvert who's sitting, you should stand. If you're an ext extrovert who is an external processor, I want you to raise your arms. <laughs> Yes, raise your arms. Okay. <laughs> now, if you are an internal processor, then you want to, um, I want you to, to go down the level, which means that if you're, you're an extrovert, you should, but you're an internal processor, you should sit back down. If you're an introvert, who is an internal processor, you should sit up the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he was really tired. He <laughs> get, get, get back in the chairs. Um, but as you're leading the group, to be aware that um, the, the individuals in the group are very different, um, and it does feel like that. You know, so when 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 uh, it, when there's a leader who's like this, someone who is um, on the ground um, may uh, may not feel comfortable sharing. Some uh, of the people who are sitting on the ground make the best leaders, um, and. So it's not a matter of, okay, uh, the really good leaders are, are the ones that are like this. I mean, uh, sometimes it is, it is the people like Kyle on the floor who's a fantastic <laughs> leader because he's able to, to draw and, uh, and, to, uh, and to really listen and to help people to incorporate. So it, it's, not a, um, it's not a matter of right or wrong, but being aware that uh, this is the dynamic that's going on. Uh, so I wanted to give you a physical picture of what's going on. Thoughts about that? polarized thinking. It was like, okay, well, these people are introverts, these people are extroverts, and so that means we all communicate in similar ways. But the processing piece, I think, helps to give a little more detail into it where I enjoy being around people, but I don't like talking someone's ear off unless I'm lecturing, and then I am self-conscious about lecturing. So so I think it's, it's really good to see that there is diversity in what, where everyone is coming from, so then we can really complement one another as we're leading, uh, in addition to sharing a, a bit of ourselves, too. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, that, uh, going back to the leader's notes and kind of the, the guidelines we kind of give to people, so um, uh, one of the questions people ask, well, should, you know, should we go around a circle? When we ask a question, should we go around a circle? Um, so, um, what, uh, in general, uh, so for, the, like, uh, for lesson one, we would encourage for that very um, basic question, the, you know, your name and three, three facts about yourself, that's a good thing to, to go around your circle in because it's completely non-threatening um, and um, so everyone will have an answer to that. Um, and um, uh, we like to have a, a question like that which everyone answers because um, once someone actually says something at the beginning, then they're much more likely to speak later on in the group. Um, there's something kind of psych psychological about that. that. You, once you kind of cross that, well, I've already opened my mouth, well, now I'm more comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when you get to other questions that are deeper, you don't really want to go around circle because that, uh, you know, the, 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 the tension comes up and you know that you're definitely the next person and you're kind of counting down. Counting down. It's, it's distracting when you're going around a circle on a deeper question like that. So, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, so um, that's one of the implications of, of the exercise that we did. Um, 
questions or comments about that? Yep. Yes, David. So, um, one of the difficult things I have in leading a, a Bible study often is if you get one person who is very, very needy yes. and needs to talk and yes. starts over, either oversharing or unpacking stuff that's really serious. Yeah. How do you tell me how, what's the best way to do it? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so you've got six weeks together with the group, right? Um, and so, um, you know, the first week you realize, oh, wow, this guy talks an awful lot. Well, so next week, you make sure that you sit right next to that person. <laughs> and then you're not making eye contact. So the person's talking. So, you know, because when, when you're leading a group, right? And someone's sharing, and you, you, you feel like you have to talk to the person. And the more you give eye contact, then the more that person wants to talk more, right? Because you don't really really listen to. You. Well, you know, so, so you, you sit right next to them. Then it's kind of natural that you're not actually, you know, giving that much eye contact and you know, like that. So, um, and so you, you know, you're listening, of course, and you you want to, to care for them. But it's okay, you know, that's uh, you know, thank you for sharing that. That's really great. But I also, let's, you know, let's uh, let's give some other folks a, a, a chance to share, or you know, um, also just kind of encourage people. Like you know, if, if it's uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's it's a real crisis that needs to be addressed, and so of course, you know, that's uh, um, you know, can, can we can we uh, carry on this conversation after the group is done, something like that. But um, just kind of simple things of, of um, uh, yeah, just of, of how how you handle it over the long haul, so don't, don't feel like you have to solve it immediately. So then a follow-up to that question, um, then as we are welcoming the group members to our table, then should we stay standing to see where everyone is so that if we want to make sure that that person is getting the communication that they need in, in order to share, but everyone's kind of picking their seats, then should we just select last and just kind of position ourselves yeah, in, in that out. area? Okay. Yeah, just, you know, every rule will be slightly different. Yeah. yeah okay, so we'll, we'll give you principles, but we're not gonna like, this, you're gonna right. exactly this way. You right. know? So just kind of, you know, trust yourself. You don't feel like, I'm not gonna do it exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so you have good instincts. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I have a question kind of tying in, because I think that's a really good one. Um, you know, the nature of my husband and my ministry is that we deal with infertility. Nothing gets more private and personal than infertility. So um, what we have found, though, is that there are people who come in to our ministry whose needs exceed what the purpose of our ministry is. And this is clearly not meant to be group therapy. It's meant to be a way in which people can connect with each other. So I, my proposal which we use and you are not alone is if someone seems like they're exceeding the needs of what is being offered you can have a private conversation with them and perhaps point them in the right direction to where they could be heard and listened to and deal with some stuff that maybe is coming up that hadn't you hadn't expected to be facing. <laughs> thank you thank you Anna right. yes uh, because that is it's an important thing so yeah um, definitely Feel free to uh, to, uh, to uh, let us know. Like so, if, if you feel like oh my, you know, there's someone I'm actually concerned about, uh, then definitely uh, you need to talk to um, Walter or myself, um, any any of the pastors and elders, and um, and don't feel like you have to uh, as the, the leader uh, be a, a trained counselor or anything like that. So thank you Anna, for that. Um, Okay, so um, let's move on to logistics. Um, so logistics is back on page one. Sorry, we're, we're going back to work on these. These six pages have an awful lot of information. Um, but um, because, uh, yeah, there was the on again, off again nature of things. Um, so um, the logistics, uh, the dates you see there are March 5th through April 9th, so it's gonna start this Sunday. Um, there are three different time slots. Um, so uh, note that the AM option goes all the way until 11 o'clock. We're hope we're, we put down the start time 9:45. Um, we're really <laughs> hoping. Uh, Chris is the witness. Uh, Gordon promised he was going to give a 15-minute sermon yeah. on March 5th. He promised <laughs> <laughs> that he was going to give a 15-minute sermon um, on Sunday, March the 5th, at the 8:30 service, um, because there's also communion, um, and <laughs> which he insisted it, was, it fits the theme so perfectly and so he really wants um, to have um, he really wants the community to be on that Sunday with this um, with this sermon um, so it's not going to be easy but we're going to try to get people down at 945 um, I wouldn't be surprised if it weren't, wasn't exactly 945 <laughs> um, and um, but it, it goes all the way to 11 o'clock um, so that, that means if um, there are folks who attend the 11 o'clock service either they have to go uh, 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 go to 11 o'clock service a little bit late or whatever um, or, um, or if they ask to be excused, they can do that as well. 
Um, so there is childcare, uh, that's part of the normal um, child care program um, that's available, and we'll, we will we um, will come up with something to do with those 15 minutes um, for the for your kids if they usually get out at 1045. There is no um, meal involved, but we might have a few snacks. Um, there will be coffee starting March 12th, but no, not on March 5th. Uh, the PM option is after the 4 p.m. service, um, and the groups. Um, there, again, Gordon promised, so he, we're like, 11 o'clock service, you can preach as long as you want to. <laughs> it's just the 8.30 and the 4, it's got to be short. Um, so groups start at 5.30 um, in the fellowship hall, it goes into 6.45. We will invite um, the parents to um, grab the dinner first, um, and then childcare goes until 7. So you'll have kind of a, a, a quick moment to, to, to grab your food before you have to grab your kids. Your kids will get food, um, well, they'll get pizza, if they're over three, if they're under the three, we ask you to pack um, a dinner for them, um, bottle or whatever it is that they do. Um, the choir option uh, meets um, after the choir finishes singing the anthem, um, and uh, there's child care just for the under three, that's part of the normal program, there's no food involved with that. Um, so um, hopefully uh, we guys have you all registered. There have there, been little holes. Um, but, um, so um, I wanted to let you know that at, um, on, on the website, theparkstreet.org slash LDI, at the bottom there is a button where you can press uh, to go to the Lenten Leaders page. It's already, it's already live there now. Um, and um, so you can actually, um, we, we will post um, uh, notes. Um, so uh, it's, it's live now, it um, right now doesn't have everything, but um, so you'll be able to, the, the, like the, the leader's notes for this week, you can, you, could, you could download it. The conflict resolution survey, the, and the link um, is there, so you can click it on there, and then it's easy to email it to other, other people. Um, there are additional resources, so, so like there is a, um, Caleb uh, helped find additional resources, and so uh, if you wanna read up about the different conflict resolution styles, there's kind of these, uh, a document that lists the five different styles and, mm -hmm. and what they're like, so you can download that um, there as well. Um, so um, there is that um, Facebook. Where's Margaret? Um, so we thought we would try something new this year. It is absolutely not required, and it is definitely not for everyone. But the idea is that we will have a closed Facebook group for participants in LDI, both leaders and learners. Um, and um, the plan is that uh, Every morning I'll be posting the daily exercise there for people who check that first instead of their LDI book. Um, and also that we might be have a chance to, as a community, sort of respond to some of the teaching or for somebody to say like, holy moly, I never noticed that before about Cain and Abel or what, whatever it is. Um, and just for people who um, want that extra little bit of discussion or need that extra reminder to do their daily dis uh, exercise, that would be a place for that. Um, it is a closed group, which means you have to um, either be invited to it or accepted into the group. So anybody searching Facebook can find the group, but they cannot see anything that is written on it. So um, it's, it's closed and private in that way. Um, so you'll be getting an email um, with a link to it um, that you can accept if you choose to. Again, not required. Margaret. Thank you. She's just amazing. I can't tell you. I mean, if it weren't for her, this would not be, LDI would not be happening. Her and Elizabeth and Acacia, this would not be happening. Um, but, um, so yeah, it's true about Facebook because I, I try to go to the link. I don't do Facebook. It won't let me see anything. So yeah, it is a safe <laughs> location because it is invite only. You'll be getting the invite from Margaret and not from me who doesn't use Facebook yet. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, you'll see the Lenten leader expectations. Number one, you attend one leader training, which hooray, you guys have got that checked off. Um, and then, okay, so number two, co-leading a group of six to eight learners. So uh, again, um, we're not really sure who's going to show up. or who, uh, So today's the last official day of registration. Um, and with that, we will start forming groups. Um, and um, so, uh, but we're also um, allowing people to drop in um, March 5th and March 12th. So there's going to be some fluidity. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, the, this, we're talking about modified LDI. This is part of where it's modified. Um, in years past, it was um, we were very structured about um, what the groups were. We had people, um, when they registered, leaders and learners uh, sign up for uh, which dates they were going to be there. We, did, we used that as part of our matching. 
So if you registered before a certain date, you, you put in your schedule. If you registered after a certain date, you didn't put in your schedule. So um, we don't have everyone's schedule. Um, but um, we will um, try, uh, because uh, um, as the weeks go on, you go deeper and deeper. So the more consistency there is in the, in the groups, then the deeper you can go. Uh, so our hope is to be able to, to form groups that will stick together for the duration, but it's still a, a, still a work in progress. Um, and so do feel free, if there are people that you want to have in your group, um, feel free to, to, to reach out to them and say, hey, you know, um, register today. Um, and then if they don't register by today, then the, the, uh, the survey monkey can address them to email Margaret, and then Margaret can um, work <laughs> and um, figure out which groups we So, so um, we're going to work on uh, the group assignments um, this week. Uh, we'll try to get you um, the, the tentative uh, listing of your, of your group. Uh, but we'll have a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of the years who've been designated to, to take the drop-ins. Um, and if there, there are fewer drop-ins, then uh, we will combine um, the, the, those groups. Um, so there'll, there'll be some mixing and mingling, um, which there always is anyway. Um, but uh, if um, once you do get a group, you'll, you'll have their contact information and everything. So it'd be great if you could contact your learners once per week by email or phone. At the end of the leader's guide, there's kind of a, a, a <coughs> template that you could use um, to, to send. But again, the, the template is it's just a template. You could do something completely different. Um, and if you're doing Facebook, you could do it on Facebook instead of doing an email, or, um, however you want to do that. Uh, but the idea is to try to uh, nurture that relationship um, over these uh, six weeks. Um, and of course, as a leader, you better participate <laughs> in the, the, the thing itself, and so you want to do the daily um, Lenten exercise, exercises. Um, let's see. Um, in, uh, in terms of logistics, another thing is that um, we will probably be uh, sending you uh, emails via MailChimp um, because the stuff from Park Street almost always gets kind of that spam, which is why some of you guys got uh, the email that it was canceled but not uncanceled, and some of you guys didn't get the, the thing that it was canceled. I mean, it was, so um, so um, check your quarantine for MailChimp, um, but if you uh, don't get anything, you can always um, contact um, uh, me or Margaret would probably be um, the, the best people, or maybe Margaret, if, you, cause if you're not getting emails from me, then you better check her Gmail instead. Um, so, um, uh, let's see. Each week, so if you know you're going to be absent, it'd be great if you let us know and we'll try to move things around, um, at, and we know the schedule's changed um, last minute. Weekly leader notes go up, do go out on Thursday. Um, and if you don't rec receive it by Friday, you can email me or you can, uh, again, check, check the, uh, the, the website. Um, so any questions about logistics? Now, um, so we're going to uh, take some time for a prayer. Um, and you'll see that um, in, uh, as Walter mentioned, for, for week one, we'll have, um, your, we'll have everyone share one hope that they have for LDI. Um, but for you as leaders, we're going to ask you to share three things. Uh, and again, as we are trying to um, have you practice um, the way we're doing things, we will give you time, a chance um, of personal reflection first. Um, and we'll, uh, you have your index cards. Um, and we would love for you to write um, on the index cards um, your name, because we want to know who we're praying for. Um, and then one hope that you have um, for uh, LDI. Um, one hesitation or fear that you have about LDI. And then lastly, we're asking for a prayer request. I mean, one of the things we, re we want you to know that we know is um, we see you more than just um, leaders of a program. Um, you, are, you are our sheep, um, and we care about you. And so uh, we, we're not just concerned about making sure the program works well. We want to, uh, the chance to be able to pray for you as a person. And so what are personal requests? What's going on in your life that you would welcome prayer for? Um, and so um, we'll uh, give you to that. If, if you um, have a smartphone and want to um, save typing for us, instead of using the index card, you can go to parkstreet.org slash LDI and then click on um, the, um, on the bottom of the page it says, um, What's it? it's, uh, it, at the bottom of the page, it says you can access leader, the leader page here. It, goes, you, it takes you to the leader page. And then there it says we're collecting prayer requests. And there it's the same thing. You, you can just type um, rather than writing your note card. Um, so um, we'll, give you, um, we'll give you maybe um, two minutes um, of personal reflection and then get back into your groups of um, three. And we'll have you um, go ahead and share um, 
um, share one of those things um, with your uh, with your group, and then uh, and spend some time praying for each other. Um, let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. We thank you that we love because you first loved us. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Help us to know more deeply this love that you have for us. Help us to love others with this radical, self-giving love. God, we don't want LDI just to be a, another program, another um, drain on people's times. Mm -hmm. We want uh, you to work in us and through us, for you to work in the learners, um, and that you would bind us together by your spirit, mm -hmm. that you would help us to experience your love, to, to know your love, and uh, to love others with that same love. We invite you to change us, not just our learners, but that you would change us, that you would teach us, that you would uh, transform us, and we pray that we would love better <coughs> because of time spent uh, walking with you. Um, to you be all glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, please do make sure that um, you were, uh, you, uh, have checked that we have your registration and uh, we will be in touch soon. Thanks.